Greetings, wise grasshoppers, and welcome to your first interactive PowerPoint lecture. Um, I'll be calling them IPPLs from now on. And this is how I'm going to present a lot of the material to you due to our digital format and the circumstances of the school year. So let's go ahead and kick it off with unit one. This gives you kind of a guess as to how much time we're going to be spending on the material in unit one, which pretty much covers the Constitution, certain key elements of the Constitution or principles like separation of powers, my favorite F word, federalism, and theories of our democratic government. Before we dive into this PowerPoint, please make sure that you have your note taking guide either pulled up on your computer or printed out. And that's the unit one, chapters one and two. The first thing I want to make sure you understand is the difference between politics and government. So this course, if you look on your transcript later on, is called Advanced Placement, U.S. Government and Politics, and they are two very different things. Think of when you've heard people use these terms in the past. When they say government, usually they're talking about the president or Congress. Those are institutions. Uh, within our government. And think of how you've heard the term politics. I imagine you've most likely heard it in a rather negative light. Uh, people saying that they don't like to play politics, uh, they don't appreciate the politics involved when making decisions. So when we refer to politics, we're talking about the actual process of influencing the actions and policies of a government. So what sort of deals are being made behind closed doors or, you know, out in the open. Um, how is it that a person's personal political preferences come into play when they're trying to get legislation passed, okay? Government is referring to the rules and the institutions that make up our system of policy making. So like I said a moment ago, think of Congress, think of the executive branch, think of the judicial branch. These are institutions and all the laws that we're expected to follow, these are rules. I hope that helps. Before we can really talk about the government we have today, we need to kind of revisit how we got to this point. So let's remember why the colonists for the most part came to America. They were doing so looking for economic opportunity or to escape religious persecution. So you have folks who are coming here who are pretty motivated individuals. Um, and what the British did in terms of salutary neglect allowed the colonists to kind of grow and expand in their ideas and their self-governance. So salutary neglect was the British policy to kind of let the colonists do their own thing. As long as they were participating in the mercantilist relationship the way that the British wanted them to, meaning supplying raw materials and then buying more expensive manufactured goods, then the British felt no need to hover over them. And so the colonists began to, you know, do what most people would do if they have the opportunity to be left alone and develop on their own. And they thought for themselves more and they developed policies that were geared more towards their individual towns. So salutary neglect really did spawn democracy, which of course is the concept of power being in the hands of the people. And we see this with some examples of early government. Um, you've got the very first representative assembly in Jamestown, Virginia, known as the House of Burgesses. This was following Bacon's Rebellion where it was a commonly held belief that the upstart colonists needed to kind of have a mindful eye over them. And so people elected Burgesses to represent their will on, you know, a governing body. And when I say people, of course, I mean, you know, white male landowners. But, you know, we'll talk more about that later. Also, you have the first governing document, the Mayflower Compact, signed by the Pilgrims as they got off the Mayflower. Um landing at Plymouth Rock. But I really want to hit this point home for you. A big thing that inspired democracy in our nation was the Enlightenment, okay? So let's meet some of these enlightened thinkers. 
And if you had to remember only one, John Locke is really the one you should know. Uh, we're going to give him credit for the social contract theory, but before we get too into that, I want you to focus on his idea of natural rights of man, okay? When you think of natural rights, hopefully you're thinking of something that everybody has. It's, it's not given to them by any particular person. It's just inalienable. It's there. Nobody can take it away. And according to John Locke, these three rights were life, liberty, and property. Now, I'm hoping for a few of you out there that's sounding familiar. Is that making you guys think of any other important historical document? And feel free to answer me out loud when you're at home by yourself listening to this PowerPoint. If you said the Declaration of Independence, you're right. And of course, who wrote the Declaration of Independence? If you said Thomas Jefferson, boo yeah, good for you. And if you are the overachiever who said, well, actually, Miss Etter, it's the Committee of Five, which also includes John Adams, Ben Franklin, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston, then, I mean, you know, <laughs> applause, my friend, you are all correct. Um, Jefferson, of course, changed property to pursuit of happiness, but that property component, y'all, is huge. I mean, so significant. A lot of people believe that's what the founding fathers were most concerned with out of anything at all is the right to own and protect your property. We're actually gonna do a reading by a man uh, named Richard Hofstetter uh, on that particular concept in a little bit. But I digress. That's gonna happen pretty often, get used to it. <laughs> um, so life, liberty, and property, these are natural rights, okay? The social contract theory suggests that it was the people who actually allow the government to rule over them. So we make a deal with the government and we say, yes, you can do this because you're going to protect our rights. In other words, y'all, we have 100% total freedom, right? Without any government. We, to give the government its power, are surrendering 1%, maybe 2% of that total freedom in exchange for protection of the remaining 98 or 99%. And we're down with that. That is okay. The rulers are supposed to be servants of the people of the community. And if they break the contract they made with us to protect our rights, then peace out. Let's get rid of them. Let's remove them. That's how the social contract theory works. And of course, guys, you saw that in action with the impeachment trial of President Trump just past year. Now, not everybody had a um, super duper optimistic view uh, during the enlightenment of, um, of government. Hobbes also believed that it was necessary that if we didn't have government, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Picture caveman one beating caveman two over the head with a club for his dinner, right? He believed that government is needed to protect the people, literally to protect each other from each other. Um, but he actually thought absolute monarchy was the best, so eh, we're not gonna focus on Thomas Hobbes too much, except for that fabulous hairdo, am I right? I mean, check that out, guys, that is intense. That is a man who does not want to accept the fact that he is balding. Um, and then we've got Baron de Montesquieu, really important guy. He also believed that government was necessary to protect the rights of the people, but his big issue was in uh, having the government's power concentrated with one person or one body. So he felt that government needed a separation of powers or branches to avoid greed and corruption. And of course, you guys know our three branches are, say out loud, if you said executive, legislative, and judicial, you are correct. And if you didn't, don't worry. We have a schoolhouse rock for you. Okay. Thanks, Enlightenment. So all of these Enlightened thinkers not only influenced the Declaration of Independence, but they also influenced the Constitution. Like we just said, Montesquieu is separation of powers. We see that in Article 1, devoted to Congress. Article 2, devoted to the executive branch. Article 3, devoted to the judicial branch but they also helped to establish American political culture. When I say American political culture, and hopefully you're with me on your note-taking guide number three, I'm talking about a set of beliefs, customs, traditions, and values that Americans share. Um, for example, Americans believe for the most part that our country is kind of the best. Customs and traditions can include the fact that we have a two-party system, essentially, always have, and dare I say, always will. 
uh, values. We all value our civil liberties. Those are all of our um, right to speech, press, assembly, petition, religion, et cetera, in the Bill of Rights. Um, so that's political culture. Other elements to that is the concept of popular sovereignty. You guys remember that from, um, you know, Stephen Douglas with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, where the people were able to choose whether or not their state would be free or slave. Well, popular sovereignty for our purposes is the idea that the government's right to rule comes from the people. Okay, we are the sovereign ones. Also, you have the concept of republicanism. If you've heard America referred to as a republic, that's because we don't have a direct democracy. That's not possible, <laughs> especially right now. We can't have every person voting on everything. Maybe the New England colonies were able to pull it off for a little bit. And by every person, of course, I mean rich, white, Christian male landowners. Um, but now we elect representatives. And one representative represents, you know, I mean, really, I think it's closer to 750 to 800,000 people now. So that's how our republic works. Um, like I mentioned earlier, those ina inalienable rights or Locke's natural rights of man, uh, things that cannot be taken away by the government. Then we also have two visions of liberty. You've got freedom from the government, so the government cannot interfere with your right to do something, but then you also have freedom to pursue your dreams. So the government cannot take your property and you do have the opportunity to obtain property. Um, and of course, the pursuit of happiness, I'm sure you've heard that before, and pursuing the American dream, and then religion. I mean, whenever you talk to Americans about what they hold very near and dear to their heart, freedom of religion is right up there with the other top ones. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. We've got some theories on American democracy, how it works, and there's three that we're going to take notes on today. The first, and I'm on number four of your note-taking guide, the back of page one, is participatory democracy. This is referring to the idea that it's widespread political participation that drives our democracy. So people turning out and voting in mass numbers, um, people joining civil society groups that are independent from government control. These are things like interest groups. I'm sure some of you have parents who are members of the National Rifle Association or the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, or the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, colored persons, excuse me. You know what I'm talking about. The AARP, American Association of Retired Persons. When we show up to participate in large, large numbers, that's what drives our democracy to work and keep power in the hands of the people. That's one theory of how our democracy works. Here's another one, and this is one that is probably the most widely accepted by political scientists, and it's called pluralism. The idea that there's numerous groups out there or factions, get used to that fun F word, we'll be seeing a lot in uh, Federalist 10, which we're going to read next week. But the idea that there's so many factions out there competing for control of the policy agenda, like all the groups I just mentioned. The AARP wants to ensure that Social Security stays available and funded. Uh, the NRA wants to make sure that there's less government policies uh, advocating gun control. Uh, the ACLU wants to really protect individual rights and um, eliminate discriminatory statutes. Everybody is competing for a piece of that pie for control of the policy agenda. There's so many groups that no one group can dominate. So you got to compromise on policy, right? Um, for every pro-life group, there's a pro-choice group. You see what I'm saying? Ambition itself counteracts ambition. And what usually happens in our democracy is a more centrist or moderate position prevails. So that's the pluralist theory of democracy. Then you've got the elitist theory. This one is uh, not as bright-eyed and bushy-tailed or uh, positive as the other ones. Uh, this one suggests that really it's the elite that control things, right? It's less optimistic. They say that society is divided by class and ruled by those with wealth. I'm sure you all have heard the phrase, he who holds the gold holds the power. Well, since there's a small amount of people out there, 
that have a ton of money, they're the ones who are really writing legislation and seeing legislation pass that we have to follow. So they have a disproportionate amount of influence. So those are your three. Make sure you know those. Chances of those popping up on an AP exam are pretty, pretty high. Here's a little political cartoon for you. Just uh, look at it for a moment, take it all in. Now, which theory of democracy would you say this is making fun of? If you said pluralist, you got it. Okay, so all of this is plainly visible in our governing documents. So let's look at one of our foundational documents. Now notice the word choice I use there. This is a foundational document. We have nine in the course that we have to know. And lucky you, six of them will be taught in this unit. Woohoo! Um, but I did not call the Declaration of Independence a governing document because it's not a governing document. Okay? And uh, as you read it, which you're doing for homework assignment, you'll see that more. And hopefully you did this a little bit last year as well. Let's get the basics down, okay, folks? All righty. So the Declaration of Independence is going to list the philosophy, grievances, and the right that we have to revolt. Philosophy meaning all of those enlightened thinkers that influenced the writers and founding fathers and providing justification for our actions of breaking free from a tyrannical rule of Great Britain. Remember, no taxation without representation. That's, that's a big concept here. List of grievances. Have you ever gotten into a fight with a loved one and you just, I mean, it's like the trunk of where you were putting all of your feelings, angry feelings, and just burying them deep, 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 deep down inside gets opened up and you say, you did this, you did this, you did this. That's kind of what Jefferson and the Committee of Five did for a section of the Declaration. Um, they said, and now we're going to list the causes that impel us to um, break free. And they call out the king and for everything that he has done wrong. Uh, and then of course we end it with the fact saying that we're independent, y'all, what, what? So um, the Declaration definitely has enlightened influence coming from the natural rights of man. Jefferson calls them unalienable rights uh, based on our humanity. Um, their natural law, their superior to man-made laws. Locke called it life, liberty, property. Jefferson changes it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then we also see elements of the social contract, again, coming from Locke, also uh, Rousseau contributing to that, with the government has the power because of the consent of the governed. And if the governed do not give consent in this case, to Parliament, and they're not doing that because they're not represented in Parliament, then that government is invalid, okay? Uh, and the government should be limited. Obviously, Great Britain was not limited. They had a uh, monarchy, at, you know, at the time, as opposed now to their um, constitutional monarchy. It's a little bit different than what King George was doing. Uh, okay, so let's fill out this chart together, shall we? Oh, before we fill out the chart, you've got some fabulous parts of the Declaration. You've uh, come across these in your reading and in our discussion. We're going to hit them pretty hard. Hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. If you want to jot that out to the side, that's, that's a pretty big concept that the government gets its power from the consent of the governed. Uh, I know with the last AP exams, I saw that quite a bit where the college board, if they included the declaration in documents to be cited, they were really looking for this key portion of the declaration that the government gets their power from the consent of the governed. So feel free to pause the video, write that down. That is up to you. And we're going over all this in our reading, so I'm just gonna 
zip through this pretty quickly. Woo woo. Before I show you my pictures from visiting Independence Hall, let's make sure we fill in number five declaration of independence here. Um, so for where it says when signed, let's also add in a where. I think you guys know this date. July 4th, 1776. I'll never forget uh, my first or second year teaching somebody when I said that, said out loud, very, very loud. Oh, yes, Independence Day. It's called that for a reason. So July 4th, 1776 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Have you guys been to Philadelphia? I loved it purely for historical reasons, but other than that, it was just kind of dirty. Blech. I was kind of disappointed. And the cheesesteaks, again, not that impressed. I'm not a cheese whiz fan. So, blah. Alrighty, written by whom? And I indicated for you to include the Committee of Five here. So just make sure you know that it's TJ, who is pretty much the author of the Declaration of Independence. It's kind of like the person who does most of the work in a group assignment and the rest of you just sign your names. Yeah, you, you know who you are. Uh, but also the Committee of Five included Ben Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. Influenced by whom and how? Uh, you could say John Locke, the Enlightenment. And in parentheses, I would put natural rights because I mean, the. And Thomas Jefferson was influenced by another Thomas. Anybody know who? If anybody out there said Thomas Paine, you are correct amundo. Go you. So T. Paine, yes, I give the Founding Fathers nicknames. You'll be fine. Uh, T. Paine is the author of Common Sense. And in Common Sense, Thomas Paine wrote that it was common sense that we should govern ourselves, uh, among other things. So he also influenced the Committee of Five in writing this foundational document. For the next one, what are unalienable rights? I really hope you can write down the three. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And these are things that government cannot take away. Uh, they're given to you by nature or nature's God, however you want to look at that, okay? Rights that the government cannot take away, rights that every human being has. And then what does it include? This is where a wise grasshopper would write C, D-O-I, packet. C as in S-E-E, -E, okay? Because you don't need to write every single other little thing down because you've got it written down on your primary document analysis packet. Woo-woo! Okay, now that that is done, please take a moment and look at these fabulous pictures that I took of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. So that's an artist rendering of it. Uh, the picture you saw before was a replica. I think there's one chair in there that's original. I was so excited. That's me. Yay. Ah, uh, to be a fly on the wall of Independence Hall. Sit among the greats. Ah, uh, Ben Franklin especially. Be frank. Yay, Independence Hall. So much fun. Liberty Bell was pretty cool too, I'm not going to lie. The great crash course you should watch on your own. Um, I'll post a link to it somewhere. We'll figure it out. Okay. Now that we have declared our independence, and let's just go ahead and say that we fought and ended the American Revolution. I'm sure your U.S. history teacher, whether you had Dr. Webb, Coach Massey, myself, uh, Coach Raker, Ms. Grable, last year, I'm sure we did the American Revolution justice. Um, let's look at the first attempt in creating a government. Let's look at the Articles of Confederation. And look, it actually lasted a pretty decent amount of time. Um, 1777 to 1789, and I'm on number six on your note-taking guide. It is the first written plan of government for our newly independent states. And 
Where I've asked you who had the most power, Circle 1 states or the federal government, the name of the governing document should give you a hint. It's the Articles of Confederation. That means that this government was confederate in form, and I imagine you've heard the term confederate before. Yeah, Confederacy, Civil War. And the Articles of Confederation and the Confederate States of America had in common their style of government, meaning the federal government had less power than the state governments, okay? The state governments were key here. So it was a Confederate style of government. Uh, there was one vote per state. Everybody was equal, regardless of your population. Can you imagine that flying today? Rhode Island and California having the same say uh, in the House of Representatives? I don't think so. Where do they have the same say? You said Senate. Good for you. Pat on the back. Um, and they had a unicameral Congress, okay? So it wasn't a House and a Senate. It was just one body, the Articles of Confederation Congress. Now, it has an end date. So that means it is no longer with us. It died. Let's talk about why. So uh, go to your chart, what the Articles of Confederation could and could not do. All right. So under the Articles of Confederation, the Congress could borrow or request money from the states. They could borrow and they could say, please, may I have money? Why don't you give that a shot? Don't go up to your parent and say, please, may I have some money? Maybe it'll work for you. What do you think? Uh, do you think it worked for the Articles of Confederation Congress? Probably not. They could declare war, just like our Congress today. They could maintain an army and navy. And they could make treaties and alliances, okay? Maintain an army and navy and make treaties and alliances. So that's what they could do. <laughs> Notice this slide has a little bit more information than the last one. Let's talk about what they could not do. Uh, they could not collect taxes from the states. So they could borrow money and request money but not demand it. Guys, if the government said, would you please give us income tax? as opposed to demand it, how much income tax do you think the government would get? Yes. Ooh, and there's something really interesting going on with that right now. President Trump in an executive order said that companies as of September 1 do not have to withhold uh, income tax or pay income tax. So that's gonna be really interesting to see what comes out of that. Uh, next up, the Articles of Confederation Congress could not control the currency in the states. So every state is making its own money. Now, for those of you who have traveled internationally, perhaps you've had to change your money before. And it's, you know, kind of fun unless the dollar sucks. And in that case, no, it's not fun. You don't want the euro, one euro to cost you $2. That's usually what it is if you go to Britain for the pound. Um, but can you imagine going to Florida for spring break and having to change to Florida money? It's nuts, man. Um, also, Congress could not regulate trade or commerce. The states were all trading with each other. So if there was a problem within the states, the Articles of Confederation Congress really didn't have any power to figure that out. Um, nine states were needed to make decisions, nine out of 13. That's a pretty hefty required majority. Uh, you don't need to write that down yet. Oh, yes, you do. Hang on. So let's finish the um, number eight on your note-taking guide. There was no executive or judicial power in the Articles of Confederation. So there was no executive branch, no president uh, that was separate from the Congress, and there was no judicial branch. So each state could be looking at the same case at the same time, and there could be 13 different interpretations on a case. That's ridiculous. Go ahead and flip the page, please. So I know I said that nine states were needed to make decisions, but that's just laws. All 13 states had to agree to amendments to the articles. So guess how many amendments there were to the articles? 
None. None, y'all. No, it's just not going to happen. Uh, each member of Congress only served one year. So, I mean, I know if you're a big fan of term limits, that sounds great to you. But it also means there was a real lack of consistency and there had to be massive reorganization every year. Um, since they couldn't demand money, they couldn't pay an army. And since they couldn't pay an army, that meant that they really had a hard time enforcing their laws. So they could request soldiers from states, but they couldn't demand it. So guys, this is a really weak central government that probably is not gonna stick around for a very long time. So why put up with it then? Why on earth are we tolerating this weak government established by the Articles of Confederation? I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. Really, I'm gonna be quiet for 20 seconds. Okay, if you think about the reasons for our country breaking with Great Britain initially, we don't want a too strong government, right? We don't want anything that resembles Great Britain, unless of course you're John Adams or Alexander Hamilton, but that's another day, another topic. Um, so we're paranoid, or like I like to tell my students, we're paranoid uh, to have anything that could get us back in a similar situation that we just left. And I mean, guys, that situation was terrible. A lot of people died. It cost a ton of money. We don't want another government like Great Britain's. But don't worry, because uh, Daniel Shays is gonna take care of everything. Let's look at the event that brought down the Articles of Confederation, Shays' Rebellion. So a lot of Massachusetts farmers were losing their farms because they could not afford to pay taxes on land that Massachusetts had to levy to pay back their war debt. Uh, and Massachusetts demanded those taxes be paid in what is called specie, which is hard money, gold or silver. Farmers didn't have that, so they revolted. And their Rebellion was actually pretty successful. I want you to literally picture the cartoon scene of Beauty and the Beast where Gaston riles up all the people in the bar to go to the beast. And he's singing, he's a beast, he's got fangs, major sharp ones. Uh, and they, all the townspeople go with their fires and their pitchforks to go to the beast castle and kill the beast. Well, that's literally what Shays' Rebellion looked like. These armors were, or these armors, these farmers were armed with pitchforks for the most part, and they went to courthouses to shut them down so the courthouses couldn't take their farms, and they won. And this went on for many months, many months. Um, the Massachusetts governor called on federal troops to try and quell the rebellion, but the Articles of Confederation Congress, since they can't demand soldiers, could not raise an adequate force uh, in enough time. Eventually, a private army had to be raised to handle it, and finally it got shut down, but not before its effects were wide felt. Um, people began to see the Articles as being too weak and unable to protect their citizens, so there was a call for a stronger national government. Not everybody thought Shays Rebellion was the worst thing in the world. Um, Thomas Jefferson actually said, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. It's a medicine necessary for the sound health of government. God forbid we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. In other words, what? Not that big of a deal. Don't freak out everybody, these things can happen, it's okay. Maybe these things should happen so that we can check in and make sure that our government is doing what it needs to do. Oh, he said another really awesome line. I don't have it in front of me. I'm gonna try to recall it off the top of my head. Let's see here. Uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is the natural manure. Somebody look that up and let me know how close I came. That was, that was pretty impressive. I'm gonna pat myself on the back there. 
But then James Madison said, you know, liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as the abuses of power. So our government is too weak and we need to do something. Shays Rebellion should not be able to happen and go on for as long as it did. So uh, the Annapolis Convention took place. Again, you don't need to write this down. It's just FYI. Held in 1876 in Annapolis, Maryland to discuss the problems that the articles could not solve. 12 delegates from five states were present, five out of 13. That is not good. You know who didn't show up? Maryland didn't show up. It's in their own backyard. But they did come to one agreement to meet in Philadelphia that next year and um, figure out what to do. Okay, so let's have the miracle at Philadelphia. Let's write a constitution, people. Here's what Ben Franklin had to say about it. I doubt whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better constitution. From such an assembly can a perfect production be expected? It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. When he was asked uh, leaving Independence Hall what they had created, his reply was a republic if you can keep it. Alrighty, before we continue, I need to warn you, some of the upcoming slides I recorded when I was in class with first period last year, so you're going to hear a lot of responses, but that's okay. I mean, we're just going to shake it up. It'll be kind of fun. All right, so let's write this thing. Where did they meet? When did they meet? So they met in Philadelphia in Independence Hall, same place for the Declaration of Independence, First and Second Continental Congresses in May of 1787. And the purpose for this meeting, this is very important, was to revise the Articles of Confederation. Revise, I'm using that word very purposefully, okay? Revise does not mean rewrite in entirety. It means what? Slightly change, alter, right? Um, so they just meant to revise. Who was there? 55 delegates. Um, usually uh, there was only 12 states represented. Does anybody know which state was not? If you said Rhode Island, you are correct. Uh, it was mostly middle and upper class, very educated men, lawyers, all landowners, many serving uh, from their state governments, etc. And they maintained total secrecy. Why do you think that might be? Just think in your head. Uh, it's the same reason for us having an electoral college because these men do not trust the average person to stop and think things through as clearly and as well as they are. They don't trust the American public to have input. They don't want them to have input. They know what they want to do, what they want to accomplish and that's what's going to happen. So if they meet in secrecy, if they black out the windows, if they um, don't talk about things, if they actually, this is true, make an effort to have somebody walk Ben Franklin to and from the meetings, in part because he was so old, but also in part because he was a chatty Cathy and he liked to have alcohol. And if he went to a bar and start, or a pub and started talking to somebody, secrets just might come out. Um, this way they can do what they want to do. But luckily for us guys, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, kept a diary. So we know what was said, we know about the compromises, and we have a little bit more insight to what went down at this fabulous meeting. But of course, factions are going to develop among the delegates over size and strength of the central government. So let's look at some of that breakdown now. Okay, so let's look at some of these plans of government that were proposed. Do you happen to recall what they are from last year? I'm a Virginia, Virginia plan and New Jersey plan. Oh my gosh, you are just fabulous. Feel good about yourselves today. There you go. Yes, yeah, shout out to Rhonda and me and Massey and Fraker and Grable, whoever you had. And you, by the way. Okay, so the person who just appeared and went away is James Madison. 
Uh, so the Virginia plan is plan one. That's the first one we're going to fill in. And the Virginia plan really placed focus on the people. Okay. In other words, um, the Virginia plan wanted to ensure that the people were represented in the legislative branch, and it was based on how many people lived in your state. The Virginia plan uh, is the one that proposed this because Virginia was the most populated state at the time. <laughs> Excuse me. So the legislative branch proposed by James Madison and by Virginia Governor Evan Randolph at the time um, was bicameral. Uh, he, they proposed that the legislative branch could be able to override state law, which is kind of what we have today because federal law is supreme over state law. But if there's a state law that Congress doesn't like, sure, they could pass a nationwide law. But usually that's going to be handled by the judicial branch. And it was uh, based on population, right? The executive branch under the Virginia plan was elected by Congress. <laughs> And there was no set size. Um, that's kind of interesting, right? Uh, how big this this uh, executive branch could be. They kind of left that up to mystery. Uh, their plan for the judicial branch was that the judges would have life tenure and they could veto state legislation. I mean, we essentially see that. They can rule legislation to be unconstitutional. And they wanted amendments to be ratified by the citizens. That's not exactly how it's done today. I've told you that amendments are ratified by the states. Do you happen to recall what um, vote is needed by the states to ratify an amendment? Three fourths. Three fourths. Yeah, that's right. Good job, Lindsay. Uh, it's a it's a super majority. It's three fourths. It's the only time that we have a seventy five percent vote because it's such a big deal. It's changing the Constitution permanently. So that's the Virginia plan. Now, oh, that was William Peterson popping in to say hello, apparently very quickly. Uh, let's talk about the New Jersey plan. It's gonna be pretty different. New Jersey was a very small state. So what do you think is going to be uh, the focus there? Yeah, it, it's gonna be more a focus on the states, right? Focusing on the unicameral Congress that the Articles of Confederation had. They liked that because why would a small state like that Articles of Confederation Congress? Oh, first period, you're amazing. And second period, I'm sure you answered that correctly. Third, four, six, go you. Uh, yes, because the Articles of Confederation had equal representation by the states. Small states had just as much say as the large states did. So their legislative branch proposed was unicameral. So that's a difference already by the Virginia plan. They proposed equal votes for each state. Uh, they proposed there to be more than one person in the executive branch. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They kind of liked how the Articles of Confederation had executive councils. Uh, and they thought those people should be removable by state majority vote. So that was interesting. Um, how do we remove the executive today? Yeah, the impeachment process, right? Congress does that. Who impeaches? House. House. And it, we have seen that very recently, right? And what then can the Senate do? The they can vote and have the trial to remove. Very good. Um, they didn't want the federal government to have really any power over the states. Guys, is William Paterson proposing much of a departure from the Articles of Confederation? No. no. Good. Uh, he did want... Oh, excuse me. The executive would have no power over the states. That's my bad. But he did like the fact that there would be supremacy of national laws. Uh, following the uh, Shays Rebellion, they realized that that was pretty crucial.com, that we have that. And uh, they wanted amendments to be ratified by the states. So there you go. And the Constitution itself to be ratified by the states. So William Paterson didn't get what he wanted. In many cases, he got the Senate, right? What did uh, Edmund Randolph and James Madison get from the legislative branch that they wanted? Bicameral. Yeah, bicameral legislature. And what part of the bicameral legislature? House of Representatives. Very good. All right, so everybody, let's uh, flip the page. Oh, whoopsies. Did we fill in that stuff on the judiciary? It was on the same side. Good. You got it. Wonderful. Um, so the... 
compromises that we have. The first one of the big compromises at the Constitutional Convention is very appropriately named the Great Compromise. Uh, if you want to call it the Connecticut Compromise, you can, but the AP exam will call it that. If you want to call it the Roger Sherman Compromise, just because you want to give him credit for something, you can. But again, the AP exam will not uh, recognize that. Y'all, this is a compromise on equality and representation of states. Okay? And like the slide tells you, it created a bicameral legislature. The upper house, I like calling it that, the upper house was based on equal representation. What do you think they mean by upper? Senate. Yeah, they do mean the Senate, but why are they, why am I using the word the upper house? Does it have anything to do with how tall they are? No. 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 Correct. They have more power, right? It's a bigger deal to be there. Uh, you have to be older to be in the Senate. They have longer terms, right? It's a bigger deal. Uh, in fact, do you guys know what the more prestigious part of British Parliament is called? House of Lords. How about that? Guess what their lower house is called? This one really kind of sucks. House of Commons. Ouch. Instead of saying House of Commons in the United States, though, we say House of Representatives. Don't you think that's nicer? Yeah. I do, too. It's, it's less derogatory. So, everybody, today the upper house is the Senate. And this did satisfy the small states. So this satisfied those Virginia, or excuse me, New Jersey plan supporters. And the lower house had representation based on population. And since it's based on population, does that explain why they have more? Good. Do you guys happen to recall that odd number? 435. 435. Very good on them. Uh, today, this is the House of Representatives, and this satisfied those large states. And in particular, Virginia at the time, they were pretty happy. Guys, that's a pretty dang good compromise, don't you think? I mean, I think that's the Mac Daddy of all compromises. I know that the great compromiser is not around yet. Henry Clay, you know, if you had me last year, you know how I feel about him. Look up at the, uh, you could say the heavens if you believe in that, or you could just say the ceiling and look, he's winking at you. I mean, you're welcome to think he's winking at you. Technically, he's winking at me because he knows he and I are having a, a dialogue all the time. But anyway, he hasn't, he's not around yet. So Roger Sherman had to uh, step in and come up with this fabulous compromise. <laughs> Yes, he's he's the goat. He's a All righty, next up is the three-fifths compromise. Y'all, you remember this, yes? Um, so the issue is the South, once they heard that there was going to be a house based on population, what did they want? Slaves to, count. slaves to count, absolutely. They wanted slaves to count towards their representation. That way they would have more people in the house more votes in the government. That's a bunch of crap. We want you to count the population. <laughs> yeah, we want you to count towards our population, but you're, we're considering you property. That's, that's a bunch of crap. And the North said, uh, no, you cannot count them because they're not technically considering them to be people. And that would allow the South to become more popular. However, if you want to count uh, slaves as people, then you've got to pay taxes for them. It's all about the money, money, money. Can't forget about the money, money, money. Okay, uh, so here's what they determined. You guys remember this. Out of every how many slaves? Five. How many will count? Yes. They count towards population in the House of Representatives, and they are counted for the purpose of determining taxation. It is a scourge on our history. Let's talk about trade. We also have a little compromise on trade during this time. 
You see southern states wanted these states to have control over the regulation of trade. They liked how that worked in the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> they were also very concerned of a federal ban on the slave trade and how much tax they would have to pay on agricultural exports. So they wanted the government to butt out of trade. Whereas the North favored federal control, they believed the government should have the ability to collect duties and tariffs. Duties is just taxes, okay? Obviously, one person wants one thing, the other side wants the other thing. The nice thing to do is meet in the middle, and so that's what we did yet again. Compromise number three. Um, so federal regulation of interstate trade and international trade will be the way it goes. If Georgia is trading with Virginia, the federal government can regulate that if need be. And if the United States of America is trading with Spain, the federal government will regulate that. However, if the, the state can regulate interstate trading, so if Savannah is trading with Macon, Georgia can deal with that all by themselves. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and they also said that they uh, would not have uh, for 20 years any export duties or a ban on the slave trade. And of course, both of those things make who happy? The South, just like federal regulation of interstate trade makes the North happy. So everybody's getting a little something of what they want. Nobody is totally happy, but no one is completely miserable. Okay. Yes, except for the uh, slaves, of course. And then we've got the executive compromise. So here's what the South wanted. And look at that. On the slide, they're labeled states' rights supporters. It's already happening, folks. Um, they wanted state legislatures to elect the president. Okay? State legislatures. Hey, FYI, back in the day, state legislatures did elect the Senate. Okay? Uh, we did not. They also favored sh a shorter presidential term and term limits, okay? Do you know what I mean when I say term limits? Yeah. A number of terms, that's right. Are there term limits on the office of the presidency? Yes. There are, how many terms can they serve? Two. Two. Um, are there term limits on Congress? No. They can serve as many times as they want. We have had representatives and senators celebrate their 100th birthdays in office. I know. I'm not even there with you second, third, fourth, and sixth periods, yet I saw your eyes grow large, and I'm, I'm with you. Um, how about judges? Do judges have term limits? Very good. No, they don't because they have life tenure. Very good. Yes. Okay. So that's what the South wanted. Let's look at what the North wanted. Okay. The North wanted direct election of the president by qualified voters. In other words, what? Yes. Rich, white, Christian, male landowners. Or let's even take it a step further. Over the age of 18, what if those rich, white, Christian male landowners just voiced what they wanted and then an even smaller, more select people were able to weigh in and say, we support the decision by the public, we do not. Who elects the president today, guys? Electoral college. That's what the North wants already. Okay. They favored a longer term and no limits. Whoa. Rut row. Rut row. Y'all, when do we have presidential term limits in the Constitution? 
Yeah, not until after FDR. Excuse me, not at the beginning, right? Oh, that sounds terrible. I'm so sorry. Certainly not in the beginning, because how many times is FDR elected? Four. Four times. Four times. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but guys, Washington set the precedent by only running for a second term. And most other presidents said, you know what? We dig that. We're going to follow what Washington did. They did that with a bunch of the things that he did. Um, and then, you know, some people disagree, right? So here's our compromise, everybody. Indirect election of the president by the Electoral College. So what do we call it when the people vote? That's the popular vote, right? That's the popular vote. Uh, that is the, but then our electors choose. And the Electoral College has a winner-take-all system in 48 out of the 50 states. So in Georgia, if Donald Trump got 51% of the vote and Hillary Clinton got 49%, all 16 of the Republican electors got to go to Washington in January to cast the vote, whereas all 16 of the Democratic electors stayed home. Okay? Yeah. Uh, they agreed that terms would be four years and there would be no limits on term numbers. And notice what I put in parentheses there. Yet. Yet. Okay. Uh, you can look at that on your own time if you want to. Uh, there's some other critical issues at the uh, convention. A lot of delegates felt that the Constitution's limited government, you don't need to write this down, um, would not threaten personal freedoms. Uh, the Constitution says very little, but does include three specific things targeting individual rights. And hopefully if you started your Constitution packet, you've seen this already. The Constitution expressly says that the government cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, in other words, they can't throw you in jail and keep you in jail without charging you with a crime. There are no bills of attainer, um, which means that you cannot be punished without a trial. There are no ex post facto laws. You cannot be in Colorado smoking a fat joint. And then um, tomorrow they make uh, marijuana illegal. The police can't knock on your door and said, you smoked marijuana yesterday when it was illegal. Now it's illegal. You're under arrest. It doesn't work that way. So this slide is devoted to the Madisonian system of voting, which was aimed specifically at preventing majority tyranny to limit majority control, essentially keeping most of the government beyond control of the masses to where regular people would have as little to do with putting those in positions of power as is possible. Let's look at this chart to show us what I'm talking about. So see right there on the left, you've got the voters and the voters are directly electing only one part of the federal government, only one part, and that's the House of Representatives. You guys see that? Uh, the voters also directly elect state legislators but then it's the state legislature that chooses the Senate, not the people. Of course, that's different today. And the voters also directly elect their or, you know, choose their electors for the Electoral College. Right. And then those individuals, they choose the president. Other ways to prevent majority tyranny is to have checks and balances ensuring that each branch can check the actions of the other two, such as Congress making laws, but the president using a veto power. Here's a fabulous chart of those. We'll dive into that much more later. And you will in your constitution packet as well. Uh, but critics say there's a lot of loopholes to that system. Federalism, you don't need to write this down. We'll talk more about it later. Establishing the federal system of government so that the power is divided between national government and state governments. And then, of course, on your note taking guide, ensuring one branch doesn't have too much power through both separation of powers and checks and balances. So there you go. Madison's suggestion and what we you know, went with uh, aim to prevent majority tyranny. OK, let's ratify the Constitution. Woohoo! 
Uh, nine out of 13 states were needed to ratify it, okay? That's the same uh, amount that were needed in the articles to make a law, so nine out of 13. And ratify means to approve, to go with, to be okay with. And how this was done is that conventions were set up in each state, which bypassed the state legislature. Maybe there were some stale folks there who uh, had been there for a while and they wanted to allow more fresh minds to come in and contribute to the discussion. Please do keep in mind though, everything that was going on was technically treasonous against the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> Not everybody liked the Constitution. In fact, there were people who really liked it and people who really did not like it. So let's look at these two opposing views. You have the Federalists and then you have the Anti-Federalists. So the Federalists are those who favored a very strong national government. They saw the Articles as way too weak. Shays Rebellion was proof of that, as well as many other things. And they felt a much stronger national government was needed to protect the nation and protect individual rights. And they're going to be led by George Washington, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. On the other side, you have your Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists really argued that individual rights and states' rights were not protected in this governing document that was created by the 55 men at the Constitutional Convention. They really favored the old way of doing things, the Articles of Confederation, and they were convinced that this new president would become a king and um, that all these individual rights that we had been fighting to protect for during the revolutionary times, you know, the right to bear arms, the right to print what you wanted, those would not be recognized or upheld by the new government. Uh, so on your note-taking guide, it says biggest issue, lack of a Bill of Rights, um, specifically a guarantee of individual rights that are protected by the national government or from the national government, even from them interfering. The Indian Federalists are going to be led by Patrick Henry. Do you guys remember him? The give me liberty or give me death guy? I hope you do. Also, Thomas Jefferson, interestingly enough, was not a fan of what took place uh, when the Constitution was written. He was actually serving as an ambassador to France at the time, so he was not at the convention. Had he been there, I'm guessing he would have spoken up quite a bit. Um, going back to the Federalist side on your note-taking guide, to convince the nation, and specifically New York, uh, that they were right and that the Constitution should be ratified, they produced the Federalist Papers. They explained how the government would work. They were a piece of propaganda, you know, trying to convince these states, these last four remaining states who had not ratified, that they should ratify the Constitution. And um, the authors were actually a group of people called Publius, P-U-B-L-I-U-S, uh, but we know them to be Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. And they wrote 85 essays, most by Hamilton, FYI, but 85 essays as to why the Constitution needed to be ratified. And going back to the anti-federal side, like I mentioned earlier, they were very frightened the president would become a king and that the government would come under control of one particular group or faction. Um, and then that would just be a it would turn into an oligarchy, essentially, one small group controlling everything, not allowing for other viewpoints or other people to have a say in the government. Obviously, they fight through the Federalist Papers. The Anti-Federalists will respond. Uh, we'll read Brutus 1. At this point in your note-taking guide, you'll be able to fill this in after we have our in-class discussion of Federalist 10, Federalist 51, and Brutus 1. So feel free to go ahead and skip ahead to number 11. So now that you know a little bit more about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, let's talk about this order of ratification. So in 1788, the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratifies the Constitution, but still, even though they only needed nine out of 13, they wanted the remaining four states to say yes to the new government. And more specifically, they needed New York and Virginia. The other two, North Carolina and Rhode Island, I mean, you know, they're important, but New York 
was the center for industry at the time, and Virginia was the most populated state at the time. So really, you couldn't move ahead without these two anchor states, if you will. So Madison did promise to introduce a Bill of Rights at the first meeting of the Congress once the new government um, went into action. And so because of this promise, and you know, you could argue in part because of the Federalist Papers, Virginia and New York ratified in the summer of 1788 and the Constitution went into action. New York City was chosen as the first capital. George Washington was chosen as the first president of the United States by unanimous vote. Actually, he is the only president to hold that distinction. Um, James Monroe was coming really close to also being voted in unanimously uh, by the Electoral College. And so one elector specifically and purposefully voted against him, not because he didn't want him to be president, but he said he wanted Washington to be the only president with that distinction. And this just shows you the order of the states in which they ratified and what the vote was for and against and the date. And hey, check it out. Georgia has a little claim to fame. Four states ratify, 26 to zero. Whoop, whoop. Like I said, obviously, in order for this to happen, compromise needed to take place. So the Bill of Rights was written and uh, was added to the Constitution, the first 10 amendments. Actually, 12 were proposed, but only 10 were ratified by the required three-fourths of the states. And then the concept of federalism did, in a small sense, um, calm those very loud states' rights supporters, because federalism does allow for state and national governments to have their own powers, even though the national government is supreme, Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the Constitution, the states do have, you know, fair game to do whatever isn't in the Constitution. So that quelled some of those loud cries of uh, foul play. These anti-federalists. Guys, I don't know why this keeps doing this but I've tried five times to get it to start at the beginning. So just do me a favor and look up this TED ed. Why weren't the Bill of Rights a part of the Constitution originally? Please and thank you. Save me the ginormous headache that has started to form. Okay, so let's take a look at the Bill of Rights. Uh, hopefully you remember that it was James Madison. I'm on number 12, by the way who volunteered to write this to get the Anti-Federalist on board and go ahead and ratify the Constitution as it was. Originally, out of all the suggestions he took, he received, or he uh, narrowed it down to 12, and he took those to Congress and 10 passed. Um, the two thirds majority of Congress that was necessary to officially propose them, and they went out to these states, and finally three quarters of the state legislatures approved them as well, and thus all 10 were ratified in one fell swoop in 1791. So let's very quickly go over what they are. So Amendment 1, as you can see in the top left picture, gives us five freedoms, that of speech, press, religion, assembly, and petition. Sometimes people like to break down the freedom of religion into the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and we will do that when we get to unit three, civil rights and liberties. The First Amendment is obviously the most well-known uh, because it's number one and because including speech and religion, those are probably the two that the vast majority of Americans could recall off the top of their head. The Second Amendment, as you can tell by the picture, is the right to bear arms. Notice that is a military person, perhaps could be construed as a militia member because it says the states have the rights to um, maintain a militia. The Third Amendment, you can see the soldiers being X'd out while inside of a home. There is no quartering of troops, meaning no troops can be forced to stay in your home. The Fourth Amendment, the picture for this one is a welcome mat, which is ironically telling you to go away and come back once you have a warrant. So the Fourth Amendment is the search and seizure amendment. It says you may not search or seize any property without a warrant. And again, I, 
I could spend an entire day on every one of these. We're going to do that later. The Fifth Amendment has a couple of pictures here. Uh, the first is the gentleman with his mouth as a zipper because the Fifth Amendment involves five specific liberties. Uh, one of them is the right to remain silent. So if you've ever heard somebody say that they plead the fifth, that means they're choosing to not answer a question that they that could incriminate them. Um, so the right to remain silent, which has been incorporated into our Miranda rights. You also have due process mentioned for the first time in the Fifth Amendment, which basically says that if you are going to lose your rights to life, liberty, or property, then due process of law must be followed. You've got to be arrested. You've got to be charged. You've got to have a fair trial by jury, etc. The third part of the Fifth Amendment is your right to a grand jury and a capital crime. So that's a murder case uh, that would involve the death penalty. You have the right to a grand jury to determine if there's enough evidence even to proceed. Another portion of the Fifth Amendment is double jeopardy. This is not only a really cool Ashley Judd movie, uh, but it's also this concept that says you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can rob a bank, serve your time, get out of jail, and then go back in and rob that same bank and be worry-free. No, no, nay, nay. That just means that if the government is going, if you're going to be tried for robbing a bank and you're found not guilty, they can't say, oh, oh, well, let us try again. So that's double jeopardy. And then the fifth and final part of the Fifth Amendment uh, is the picture on your screen of Uncle Sam reaching towards the house and the person trying to protect their property. Eminent Domain says that the government cannot take private property for public use without granting just compensation. Uh, of course, the problem is, what is just compensation? It involves fair market value and some other things that we'll talk about later. Amendment 6 is the picture of the jury there. It involves rights of the accused. And there's a few things that you could write there for rights of the accused. The right to counsel, which means the right to an attorney. The right to a speedy and public trial. Uh, they can't hold you in jail forever. It cannot be a secret trial where nobody knows about it. And of course, a trial by a jury of your peers because you're more likely to um, have a jury of your peers give you a fair trial than say a jury full of people who don't like you or don't like people like you. The Seventh Amendment is pretty similar to the Sixth Amendment in the jury aspect. It says that if it is a civil case, which means there is not a crime that has taken place, perhaps you're suing someone for something. If the amount involved is a, um, if it meets a certain level, then you can have a jury. Uh, at the time of the Constitution, it was $20. Obviously, that's gone up today. Today, it's $1,500. That's the threshold. The Eighth Amendment is our bottom left picture. Uh, no cruel and unusual punishment. And so some of you might be saying, well, why is there a picture of uh, death penalty methods there? That's because the death penalty itself has been found to uh, not be in violation of the Eighth Amendment. And that is another day, another topic or debate. The Ninth Amendment, you can see in the picture here, you have a police officer telling the person they're not allowed to fly the plane, and the uh, pilot is saying back to the officer, yes, I am. The Constitution says that even though it doesn't directly say it, I can fly a plane. That's pretty accurate. The Ninth Amendment is called unenumerated rights, and those are rights for the people. Anything that is not in the Constitution that is reserved to the states or the federal government, or if it's not denied to the people, the people can do it. It's fair game, like the ability to drive, the ability to consume alcohol at a certain age, uh, the ability to, um, I mean, in some states, use marijuana for recreational or medicinal use, um, all sorts of things. The ability to pick out what you're going to wear. Uh, but you do have to wear something, so that, that doesn't work um, with the Ninth Amendment. Although in nudist colonies, it does. Okay, I digress. Uh, last but not least, we have the 10th Amendment, and uh, these are reserved powers for the states. It's very similar to the 9th Amendment, but this time it applies to the states. So if it's not denied to the states or set aside for the federal government in the Constitution, then the states can regulate it, like driving age, drinking age, etc.
first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, also known as the Bill of Rights, were ratified or passed over 200 years ago. But even though they're a bit, well, old, these first 10 amendments are still the most debated and discussed section of our Constitution today. So can you remember what they are? Let's take a look. The First Amendment is the freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and petition. This may be the most revered of the amendments. The First Amendment protects our rights to say and write our opinions, worship how we please, assemble together peacefully, and petition our government if we feel the need. The Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. The original intent of the Second Amendment was to protect colonists from the invading British soldiers, but it now guarantees that you have the right to own a gun to defend yourself and your property. The Third Amendment is called the Quartering Amendment. It was written in response to the British occupation and as a result of the colonists having to house or quarter soldiers in their homes during the American Revolution. Because of this amendment, our government can never force us to house soldiers in our home. The Fourth Amendment is the right to search and seizure. The police can't come into our home without a search warrant and take our personal property. Today, many concerns have arisen about our rights to privacy and technology. For example, can the government track your location with your smartphone, or can social media postings such as on Facebook and Twitter be used without a warrant? On to the fifth. It's all about due process. You've probably heard the phrase, I plead the fifth, in movies or on TV. They're talking about the Fifth Amendment which says that you don't have to take the witness stand against yourself if you may end up incriminating yourself. Okay, we're halfway done. The Sixth and Seventh Amendments are about how the legal system works. If you're accused of a crime, you have the right to a speedy public trial and an impartial jury. You also have the right to a lawyer and the right to take the stand if you choose. This is important because it will prevent the accused from sitting in prison forever and insist that the prosecution proceed with undue delay. The seven says you have the right to a jury trial where 12 impartial peers decide your innocence or guilt in the courtroom as opposed to a judge doing it all alone. The Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Is a death penalty cruel? Is it unusual? It's hard for Americans to agree on the definitions of cruel and unusual. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments are called the Non-Rights Amendments. They say that the rights not listed in the Bill of Rights are retained by the people in the state. You have other rights that are not listed in the Constitution, and the states have the right to make their own policies, like instituting state taxes. So, now you know all ten amendments. Can you remember them all? If not, remember this. The Bill of Rights are a crucial piece of American history, and though society has undergone many changes these past 200 and some years, the interpretation and application of these amendments are as vital today as they were when they were written. All right, so hopefully you've got a real good idea of those Bill of Rights, not only through what I told you, but what that video just reaffirmed. And this is just some interesting Constitution trivia. Feel free to pause here, read through it. It's kind of fun. Okay, let's pick up with our note-taking guide on number 13, Principles of the Constitution. So we've got a lot of major ideas or... Um, uh, for lack of a better word, principles that come our way from the Constitution and popular sovereignty is one of those. And that's just the idea that the government gets its power from the consent of the people. And if you remember, this was one of the main ideas in the Declaration of Independence. There's also the concept of limited government, that the government only has the power that the people give it, and thus it's bound to the powers that comes its way from the Constitution. This prohibits the government from growing outside of a level of power the people are comfortable with. And of course, keep in mind, in 1787, the American Revolution was not that long ago, and so we're not looking to create a too powerful government. The next principle uh, of note is separation of powers. Remember, this was the idea that we got from the enlightened thinker Baron de Montesquieu, and it's that the power of the government, the national government, is going to be divided into three branches to ensure that no one branch has more power than it should have. And so here you see the legislative branch divided into, uh, since it's a bicameral legislature, the House and the Senate. 
the executive branch made up of the president, vice president, and even though it's not pictured here, the bureaucracy, and then the judicial branch, which at the time of the Constitution included the Supreme Court. Right along with separation of powers is the concept of checks and balances, the idea that each branch has powers over the other branches in an attempt to balance their power. Um, so a good example of this might be Congress, even though they pass laws, the president has the opportunity to veto that legislation. And then Congress can override that veto. So that's check, balance, check. Kind of interesting. Uh, also, the president nominates judges, but Congress has to confirm those judges to the Supreme Court or uh, other federal courts. And if um, the executive branch does something that the judicial branch doesn't like, they can declare that act to be unconstitutional. In terms of judicial review, I want to make sure you understand that that means the Supreme Court has the power to determine if a law is constitutional or not. And this comes from the very important case, Marbury versus Madison, that I promise you we will look at in more detail when we get to uh, our next unit and the judicial branch. So that case again is Marbury versus Madison. And then in terms of national supremacy, that's where if a state and federal law contradict, the federal law wins. Don't forget that comes from the supremacy clause of Article 6 of the Constitution. And uh, you've got a good little image that shows you an example of that right there. And then it's federalism, the idea of governmental power being divided between the national and state powers. So states can do some things and the federal government can do some things. Now, the Founding Fathers recognized that the Constitution was not perfect. And in order for it to remain relevant and be able to evolve with society, they knew that it might need to be changed from time to time. So changing it is very, very difficult. You've got a lot of competing interests out there. Super majorities are needed, which is anything above 51% or 50% plus one vote. And so in order to ensure that it's not easy to make sure that majority tyranny is unable to just pass amendments left and right that violate the rights of the minority, they came up with this reasonable time limit for ratification. Usually it's seven years. So if the amendment is proposed by Congress with the vote required, the states have seven years to pass the amendment. I don't know if you guys remember last year, but the Equal Rights Amendment all of a sudden got some buzz again, I believe because Virginia state legislature became democratic and they decided to ratify it. They were one of the states that did not back when they were attempting to do it in the 70s and 80s. Um, but that doesn't stand because the time for ratification had passed. Uh, the only amendment where this is an exception is the 27th Amendment. The 27th Amendment was ratified in 1992, and I'm going to ask you in class when it was proposed for the first time, so feel free to look that up. Also, there's no national convention that's ever been held to propose an amendment because some people are just kind of uneasy with that idea. So here's how you can amend the Constitution, and just so you guys know, there's 27 amendments. So process one, or excuse me, uh, step one is the proposal. One way that you can do this is two thirds of the members of both the House and the Senate can agree that an amendment should be proposed. Or it can take place at a convention that's called by two thirds of the states. Uh, that only happened with the Constitutional Convention. So there you go. The rest of them have um, been proposed by two thirds of both the House and the Senate. So two thirds to propose, remember that. Ratification, making sure that it's actually approved requires a more uh, sizable vote in majority and that's three fourths. So for an amendment to be ratified, it can be done so by three fourths of the state legislatures or by three fourths of ratification conventions in the states. So let's see here, I'm just doing some quick math. That would need to be 38 states agreeing to ratify a proposed amendment 
for it to become the 28th Amendment. Another little picture for you there. One time they uh, passed the 21st Amendment in a little bit of a different ratification process, and that was by three quarters of special state conventions. And Amendment 21 is the amendment that ends prohibition, by the way. So this video is also being a bit of a jerk. So if you would like to watch it up, by all means, just look up Ted Ed, why is the Constitution so hard to amend, if you would like further explanation. Besides the formal changes to the Constitution, which are the 27 amendments, there have been other informal changes allowing it to evolve. One example is congressional elaboration. The idea that the laws that are passed by Congress can define or redefine words of the Constitution. We see this in the application of the Necessary and Proper Clause or the Elastic Clause. I'll talk more about that later as well as the Commerce Clause, which has to do with trade. Again, I'll talk about that later, and the use of impeachment. We also see it through presidential actions, such as expanding the president's war-making powers, uh, also the president using the executive order power. And I'm sure you've heard that phrase. Uh, president Trump signed an executive order, I think, two weeks ago. And these have the force of law, but do not require congressional approval, okay? They have the force of law, but do not require congressional approval. So the president gets to kind of skip Congress and uh, issue this. Another example of expanding presidential powers is through the use of executive privilege. And this refers to certain powers that only the president has. Uh, things that they don't have to report to Congress or the American public. Also, the power of executive agreements. Executive agreements. These are very similar to executive orders. So executive orders are, are to laws what executive agreements are to treaties. Um, they're pacts with foreign heads of state, and they're legally binding. But yet again, they bypass the Senate. And it's raining. Goody for me. Another way the Constitution has evolved in, you know, the past 200 plus years is through judicial review. Now, Judicial review is not in the Constitution. The Supreme Court had to clarify their powers in John Marshall's first case as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And that was established, like I mentioned earlier, in the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. And we will talk about that case at length, but just so you know, this is the first time that SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States, ruled a congressional law unconstitutional. And the lasting legacy was that the courts are the official interpreters of law. It's the courts that interpret the laws and determine if something is just or is not just, is constitutional or is not constitutional. And what this does is pretty neat. This allows the Supreme Court to adapt the Constitution to modern situations. So current cases having to do with marijuana, um, LGBTQIA plus community rights and uh, discrimination suits. Those things are not mentioned in the Constitution, yet the Supreme Court is ruling on them. So it really does allow them to ensure that this Constitution stays a living, breathing document, even though it's way old. And that's what that means, living document, that it still applies today and fits with today's modern society. Changing political practices um, also allows the Constitution to evolve. Political parties are nowhere in the Constitution, but they completely control the political process. There I said it, it's out on the table. Uh, through nomination of presidential candidates, organization and running of Congress, 
Uh, the use of electoral college, now more of a rubber stamp for the popular vote than a deciding factor. There are more demands on policymakers now, especially because of the evolution of media and how people are involved. I mean, gosh, social media by itself, which, you know, is the use of technology. So close to being done, guys. You're doing awesome. Okay, so just to circle back around to the beginning, when we're talking about democracy, we're talking about a government by the people. Uh, this is a government where the people have the ultimate political authority. Think of the roots of ancient Greece. Think of our enlightened thinkers, Montesquieu and Locke. And there are two types of democracy. You have direct or pure democracy. And that's probably what you would have seen um, in New England when the country was first started, where everybody's voting on everything. Uh, people are eligible to participate and vote directly on laws. They participate in the selection of officials and government decisions. Is that what we have? I hope that you're out there saying no, it's not. We have an indirect or representative democracy. We have a republic. And this is where eligible people people who are citizens, people who qualify, who have not been disenfranchised, elect officials, and those people make decisions for us. They govern, they pass laws. You know, democracy kind of assumes that the electorate, the people who participate, in the political process is capable of making rational decisions and willing to invest time to make those decisions. As you know, the founding fathers are pretty skeptical of that. And when we complete our Richard Hofstetter reading this weekend, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, I'll be curious to know, what about you? Do you think today's electorate is capable of making rational decisions and investing time to making those decisions? in a meaningful way. And just next.
And you're done.